Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tom Wilson, Chairman of the Lancer Section, and welcome to our uh, section meeting, first of this 2020-2021 uh, session. Hopefully you can see the screen. Uh, that's the agenda for this evening. And uh, make yourself comfortable, furnish yourself with a drink. We're going to begin prompt at 17.30ish. <laughs> depends depends on how many people turn up between now and then. We've got a, a good show so far. So I'll just flick forward to our first slide. We'll be recording this uh, later, but I'll run through the domestic arrangements at the right time. So please just settle down and know that we are here. Uh, if somebody in the audience could just open up the chat pop-up uh, and just say, yes, we can hear you and we can see you, that would be most comforting.
Good evening all, it's 17.30 now. I'm just going to wait two more minutes just to let any stragglers who are struggling with the, uh, the link just to join us and then we'll make a start. Thank you. Okay, Jim says the sound is better now. Um, Jim, if you can speak and give us a section news and apologies. Hey, thank you, Tom. Uh, very little section news. I personally, I I would actually like to to welcome a number of new members. We seem to have had a surge in uh, members joining us in the last couple of weeks, and uh, if any are on tonight, I welcome to the PWI. Uh, subscriptions, I've had uh, a number of uh, our existing members not renewing their subscriptions and just a quick message to everybody, can you check, is your subscription up to date? If not, get in touch with Sarah Green or renew directly online. Uh, again, a there have been a number of our members uh, we've lost touch with because they've moved uh, jobs. And again, if people can just check that the details are up to date on uh, the PWI website so that we do have a current uh, email address. Uh, as, as we see tonight, we're uh, still on webinars rather than having uh, live face-to-face -face meetings and webinars. Uh, and this will continue until I 
the government uh, allows us to have uh, large face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, and if you can just bear with us with that, uh, next month's meeting is uh, an address by our technical director uh, on professional development and uh, how to become a professionally registered engineer. We had hoped that that, that, that could be face-to-face, -face, but that will have to be a web webinar. So we might not be able to uh, discuss individuals in any great detail. Uh, if you can bear with us on that, please. Uh, and finally, uh, just to let members know that uh, Danny uh, Beveridge, uh, a network rail structures engineer, suddenly passed away in June. Obviously, our condolences uh, to his family. And uh, if people were unaware of this, you know, we, we, we've now let you know. Uh, that's it, Tom. We have no apologies. Thanks, Jim. And just a, a reminder that tonight's session is. Uh, an ad hoc when it wasn't publicised in advance, and that's because our speakers who've arranged for tonight called off at last minute. But like the good uh, performers that we are, Jim and I have come up with something that hopefully will uh, keep you entertained for the next 40 minutes or so. So a little bit of domestic arrangements, a reminder, the meeting will be recorded, call cameras are off, the audience will be muted during the presentation, Questions will be taken at the end, and the best way to do that is to raise questions during the presentation via the dashboard chat pop-up, which hopefully you'll be able to find. The little grey button chat, open it up. There's a type message here thing. You can put your comment or your message in there. Uh, it can be answered direct by me or Jim, or what we intend to do is try and take them at the end and go through any questions that are raised, and maybe skip back to the slides that are uh, in focus. So tonight's presentation is called Steel Sleepers, Why Wouldn't You? Uh, and let me just bring the presentation up. Hopefully you can all see that opening slide. It's by myself and Jim. So just a little bit about myself and Jim. Uh, I'm the PWI Vice President for Scotland now. Uh, that's because everybody took one step back and I was left standing there thinking, oh, I could do this job as well as the PWI chairman, as well as all the other stuff I can do. And it's really getting a bit too much at the moment. So any budding chairman or chairwoman out there that who fancy having a crack at this, it's a very easy job, the chairman of the section. You just have to introduce speakers once a month on this third Wednesday of the month. For my sins, I'm the technical discipline leader for track at WSP. Jim is past PWI vice president for Scotland and he's the engineering director of Watson Real Engineering Limited, and uh, Jim stood into the uh, section secretary shoes on the retirement of Jack Scott. And again, if there's any budding secretaries looking at younger members out there who fancy a crack at being the secretary, it's not two of us, a couple of meetings a year. Um, and it's, it's good for CPD and aspirations for those who wish to become chartered engineers in the future. Little note, uh, caveat here, the opinions expressed tonight are those of Jim and I, and all photographs and illustrations are from our own collections. So, steel sleepers, why wouldn't you? Curiously titled. But it's really about uh, bringing steel sleepers uh, higher up the agenda than they are at the moment. Steel sleepers can offer significant cost savings as a replacement for life inspired timber or concrete sleepers. And this little presentation tonight will examine the benefits of steel sleepers as a replacement for those steel and concrete items. And we'll talk about a number of scenarios. We'll talk about new build, rebalanced free sleeper, free sleeper onlys, track loading over bridges and retaking at under bridges. And then we'll get into a bit about the, the sustainability aspects of these things. So steel sleepers are found favour in many of the world's railway systems. And it's important to know it's a worldwide thing. For over 30 years, the modern ones, as a low-cost alternative to timber and pre-stressed concrete. Where did it all start, this modern steel sleeper? Well, during the 1980s, cost-cutting and so on in the Nationalised Railway prompted a joint BR research and British Steel programme to reduce the costs, and they looked at that using steel sleepers. That programme 
um, tackled the policy of installing pre-stressed concrete as a main track support product, and that was abandoned in favour of more cost-effective products, of which steel sleepers is the key. So in the next 30 years from the 1980s, uh, that period saw the increasing use of steel sleepers, especially as a re-sleeper only option. However, in certain cases, over-optimistic assessment of existing ballast conditions, and that resulted in rapid deterioration of the post-relay track quality. And I'm being kind here, but really, if you look at that picture there, I think inflatable sleepers would be the only solution for that kind of thing. Oh, sorry, I skipped. That was either your finger or my finger, Jim. Oh, I was keeping my finger well away from it, Tom. <laughs> okay, so rather than blaming the process, the product, so the steel sleep itself was being held responsible for poor track quality uh, because they were put in on these conditions and then when the track uh, quality deteriorated thereafter, uh, well, well, it was obviously the steel sleeper's fault. And that reputation tarnished by poor engineering judgment led to a number of steel sleeper renewal sites being reduced, and they're now down to a handful of selected sites every year. So the track route asset managers are now avoiding installation of this track form and are even actively encouraging projects within their patch to prematurely remove any existing steel sleepers at every opportunity. Now these steel sleepers that they're removing are only just into, in some cases, their service life. So this presentation aims to redress that balance, aims to tackle the current real industry bad press associated with steel sleepers. I talked to several individuals who have no regard for a steel sleeper as a, as a, well, a useful product. It's like, oh, steel sleepers, let's get them out. We can't deal with them, can't maintain them. We just want to take them out and throw them away and put in concrete because we know how to deal with concrete. But what I want to stress in this is the importance of adopting effective steel sleeper installation techniques and applying informed renewal strategies. And that is the key to the success of this. We'll do a comparison between steel and concrete sleepers in a typical track renewal scenario. And that's going to demonstrate significant capital cost savings, typically 40% less for steel sleepers. That's CapEx, remember. The sustainability over and above the CapEx in terms of embodied carbon reduction it's typically 30%. Uh, steel has that over the pre-stressed concrete, so I'm going to explore some of the details in that. And that's important to know here. There are savings in capex and savings in sustainability. So your carbon capture stuff is all uh, better served by a steel sleeper. So in the southern hemisphere, steel sleepers were first used Wow. 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 We're not moving on very well, are we, Tom? Let's take it. It's got a life of its own. I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to have to turn my mouse upside down. Right. Right. There. So I reckon the mouse is doing it. Okay. If the slide stabilised there. In the Southern Hemisphere, steel sleepers were first used in railway track construction in the 1890s both in Australia and in Africa. Steel sleepers defeated the huge number of termites and other uh, wood boring insects that literally made a meal of timber sleepers. And with lower construction costs, steel sleepers were considered at the time to be the most cost effective method of construction and ideally suited for these light traffic frontier lines. In Europe, the use of steel sleepers is widespread especially in secondary lines and industrial track. I can't get it to stop doing that, Jim. Right. Ah. Uh -huh. Okay, it's flicked over. Fine, Tom. Yes. I uh, in Europe, as we say. Oh. There you go. Let me hold it there. Right, that's perfect. I uh, our, our European cousins, of course, have been utilising uh, steel sleepers for many years. Uh, indeed, in France, you will come across mature bullhead chaired steel sleepers. Uh, British steel, 
chorus, whatever their current name uh, in the UK, has been supplying steel sleepers uh, to continental Europe, including 20,000 steel sleepers annually to Switzerland uh, for a significant period of time. Steel sleeper switch and crossing units are commonly installed throughout the EU. And this is where I have to admit I'm actually cheating with this photograph to look at it. Steel sleeper SNC unit uh, with, with Boslo fastenings, you think right away, yeah, this is continental Europe. Well, the photograph was actually taken in Holland Blenkinsop's yard in County Durham. And this was a unit that they had made up. And we in Scotland had intended to install that at uh, Abgai, probably around about 15 years ago. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. I don't know what's happened to the unit, but it would have been a very interesting trial. Uh, probably a far more appropriate solution to our far north lines than a concrete bearer s &C. I'll see if I can get this to, to move to the next slide now, Tom. My mouse is too sensitive. Uh, modern steel sleepers have long been used in steelworks in Europe and the UK for both plain line and switches and crossings. Uh, they have been used in situations where uh, very high axle loads are experienced, including uh, where you're running molten uh, steel and molten iron in torpedo wagons. You don't want one of these coming off the track. And uh, interestingly, uh, our colleagues in the DB are undertaking research and development of steel sleepers in a somewhat different format. The Y sleeper, clearly it's something that has high frame stiffness and is very resistant to lateral shifting and can be used in quite constrained spaces. Tamping, however, might be a bit of a challenge. Now, in the UK, we have used steel sleepers since the 1930s. The Great Western Railway started using them uh, and continued with their use after the Second World War when materials uh, became a bit more easy to get. The sleepers were manufactured by GKN in South Wales and uh, were chaired for the then standard bullhead rail. Interesting to see this photograph of hand scarification. Uh, I know uh, we like to scarify at least 150 millimetres down. I don't think these guys quite got it with the rakes. Uh, after nationalisation in 1947, British Railways, as they were then, uh, adopted pre-stressed concrete sleepers as their main uh, standard ballasted track for them. The reason for that probably was, again, availability of steel. Uh, in post-war Europe. However, steel sleeper use did continue on some secondary routes. The early steel sleepers were crimp ended. Uh, whilst they were suitable for use on lightly jointed track routes, uh, they didn't offer terribly good lateral stability on modern uh, CWR track forum. The photograph, which I believe was taken relatively recently uh, on a heritage line in Wales, certainly shows the difference in depth between the concrete sleepers and the steel sleepers. Uh, this particular location is over a very shallow concrete cap uh, sewer, hence the need for a shallow track for them. Uh, in the late 80s, uh, 88, 89, British Railways in the Scottish region that did experiment with uh, crimbended steel sleepers uh, and flat bottom rail on a number of sites, including the Edinburgh and Glasgow main line at Green Hill and at Garden Kirk uh, on the Cumbernauld route. The problem there was, of course, resistance to buckling uh, during the summer, and uh, the trial sections were very quickly removed. But 
found another life. Uh, the uh, track is still in use today, albeit in the sidings at Craig and Tinney. Modern steel sleepers then. So the most modern steel sleepers are rolled as a continuously profiled trough section, uh, cut to length, and the ends are then bent into shape. So the flat top that forms the rail seat is thicker than the sides, but it has a thicker rim along the lower edge to provide bending strength. The spade ends, that's the flare and bent ends, they are about 50 mil lower than the rest of the carcass, are angled to resist lateral, to resist lateral movement. So where do we use them? They've been successfully used in Scotland in high tonnage and high speed routes. 125 mile an hour on the East Coast Mainline 8, that's at Torness on the upline, and on the West Coast Mainline at Symington in the upline, 100 mile an hour, 125 for HSTs and the like, and 100 mile an hour in EGM1, the Edinburgh Glasgow at Phillipson and Winchborough. How do they do that? Steel sleepers hold the ballast captive in the trough. So that 10 mil thick plate, from the underside of that plate, just below the rail seat, is where the ballast begins. And the first 100 mil of that is, is, is captive. It can't move within the sleeper. And they need much less ballast than traditional pre-stressed concrete sleepers because of that. So that compacted ballast held within the sleeper profile is the beginnings of the necessary support which distributes the load down to the subgrade. Steel sleepers sit in rather than on top of the ballast. And compared to concrete or timber sleepers, that allows a thinner ballast support there from the leading edge, that thick beaded edge. That means that the capital costs and reduced logistics needed to install steel sleepers generate significant economic and sustainability benefits. By far the biggest economy in using steel sleepers is in this drastically reduced requirement for new ballast. So with the top ballast layer generally having the least degraded stone that's been sitting there facing the sky in the rain for all its days, the occasional tamper comes by, but it's not really bearing any weight. It's providing lateral resistance. Steel sleepers can be installed directly into that existing ballast layer with no new ballast required quite often. And that's the typical scenario where you're doing a re-sleeper only job. You're not importing ballast, you're using what's there and you're just reusing life expired wooden or pre-stressed concrete sleepers. So those, when you're doing that, this is where you get your significant cost insulations. Uh, Evidence also suggests that lower maintenance costs can accrue over a typical lifetime, which is 50 plus years because of a reduction in subgrade failures, so your wet spots that you would experience under normal traffic along the route are reduced because the mechanical properties of the steel sleepers don't put the same forces down to the subgrade that uh, flat bottom or flat soffit sleepers do. And the sleeper life may well exceed 50 years, and the one in the picture that you can just about make out, 1935. And that was rolled, so 75 years plus in South Africa. In the UK, sales to British Rail, then Rail Track, increased during the 1990s and 2000s, with over a million sleepers manufactured and supplied to Network Rail since 2003. So what happened then? Don't know. Recent projects, 1999, 36,400 and a number of extra ones were installed during a single month long blockade on the Seattle Carlisle line. And some of you on the call might have been there. And that record I don't think has been achieved. That 36,400 steel sleepers were open to traffic after a one month blockade with no speed restrictions. It was business as usual and all of that track had been renewed. In 2006, seven steel sleepers were extensively used. Flavor of the day, everything that was going on had a steel sleeper element. Blackcomb Mulgay, Sterling Allard and in 2010, the Abbey Bathgate installed 65,000 of them. In 
In 2011, 42,000 were used on the Boston to Skegness Railway Refurbishment Project. Sleeper profiles. Never else preferred type, the 560H steel sleeper. It's fitted with a captive rail pad, panel fast clips, there's rail fixings, and they've got variants. Uh, variants that are currently be supplied and product approved by Network Rail. Five brick steel include the 560H fast clip, the standard one. Short ended ones, the SE 560H, where, for example, a catch pit in the six foot prevents you using a full width sleeper. Or the twin tube UTX steel sleeper for cable management as a low cost alternative to UTX. And glass flaked, sorry, Jim, that was you. <laughs> Did glass flake epoxy coated corrosion resistant sleepers. This is quite an interesting installation. I'm sure uh, most of the people on the webinar tonight will, will recognize the location as Sol Coats, uh, where when the wind comes up the Clyde, the waves crash over the overheads, let alone the track. Uh, this particular job started life um, as a plain line re-railing exercise. However, the pandrel clips uh, were so corroded into the concrete sleeper housings that we ended up uh, undertaking a scarify and steel re-sleeper using these corrosion resistant sleepers and of course coated rail. Uh, but obviously is a is a problem with steel because it corrodes. Uh, and and here's 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 a way on particularly aggressive sites that you can uh, mitigate that uh, corrosion. Um, perhaps an ideal application for such sleepers it would be through station platforms, where unfortunately the modern tendency is the slightest bit of frost is to cover the platform in salt, which uh, then gets onto the track, corrodes your steel sleepers, uh, and can also give problems with uh, track circuits. So, uh, a little, a little, a little example of uh, what what can what can be done. Um, see if I can move this on. Another variant, of course, is the uh, sleepers fitted out to take guardrails. Uh, as derailment containment over bridges and in similar structures. This particular example is the viaduct over the Ern near Hilton Junction. And as part of the suite of sleepers uh, to accommodate guardrail, you, you also have a uh, steel bearered gathering panels, again, photograph taken on the same site on the Lady Bank branch. And back to you, Tom. The low profile design of steel sleepers is quite unique. They are simple to handle, they're lightweight, they're easy to stack. And because you can stack them and they're light, they're cost effective to transfer either by road or by rail. Uh, that lightweight, you've got 84 kilograms typically for a steel sleeper versus 312, that kind of order, for about a quarter of the weight. Uh, it means they can be stacked along the line side in bundles of five. So you turn them around, stack them along the cess, and they can then go from that to be placed manually on a prepared ballast bed or positioned by a semi mechanized relaying process. When they're correctly installed, the spade ends of the steel sleeper profile are designed to interact with the ballast bed. So that resistance to that angle that they have on the spade produces a highly stable track support. And it requires typically only minimal quantities of fresh imported ballast to complete the installation, if at all. Quite often there's areas where you can displace the top ballast, move it to the side, install steel sleepers, and bring it, plow it back in uh, as a, uh, to fill in the tamping area and dress it off when you're finished. The unique shape of steel sleepers is their ability to capture and hold poor quality ballast. That little screenshot on the right hand side there shows what looks like cracking ballast. Good stuff. But move it on a little bit. And oh dear. So that scarification of that 
would just be such a waste of time. And that's what you get when you have a, a poor assessment of existing ballast condition. What looks like good ballast on the top, unless you've got proper SI and know that information, if you were to attempt to scarify on that particular site, it's doomed to failure. The ability of a steel sleeper to hold and, and perform better under poor quality ballast conditions has been a bit of a downfall. So they encourage scarification rather than ballast cleaning or renewal, but finds contamination in that kind of scenario, prevents feed draining, and screening of entire replacement of the ballast bed is absolutely essential. The importance of all this is an accurate engineering assessment of the existing ballast condition, and that's critical to the success of any steel sleeper or any sleeper replacement program. If you don't assess the ballast conditions correctly and try and replace sleepers, any kind of sleepers, on poor ballast, you're doomed to failure. You've got to understand when the ballast needs treated before you replace the sleepers. Unfortunately, financial pressures sometimes to improve track safety and quality by doing quick fix scarification and replacement of steel sleepers, that's always got to be balanced by that sound engineering judgment. That poor engineering judgment or an otherwise optimistic assessment of existing ballast conditions, I would say always results in a rapid deterioration of post-installation track quality. They look good, it's cosmetic, nice top up with clean ballast, and oh dear, as soon as trains start to run, it's not very long before the top starts to go off and it starts to move about and it starts to get wet spots. And these sites gain notoriety as they quickly transition from being problematic, it's a bit of an issue with that new relay, uh, to becoming, I can't maintain it, they're unmaintainable. And the only long-term solution for these things is expensive rework and replace that filled ballast bed. Unfortunately, that stage, replace the filled ballast bed, the steel sleeper gets blamed and it gets binned along with the filled ballast bed. So no surprises, steel sleepers are not a cure-all or poor ballast conditions. Installing steel sleepers where scarification can't create effective drainage paths only defers the ballast renewal, and often not for very long, and significantly increases the cost. Unfortunately, the industry bad press associated with uh, these isolated locations tends to weigh, outweigh, my apologies, the good news stories. Uh, as a result, the number of ill-judged Scanify uh, steel D sleeper sites in the early days of network rail has outweighed the success enjoyed by the predecessor rail track. Uh, it has tarnished the reputation of steel sleepers in the UK. The example we show here uh, is pure poor specification. There's basically no ballast there to scarify. So when the tamper comes along, all it does is it starts to pull clay up into the clean top ballast and pulls clay up below the steel sleeper, which inevitably will result in a geometry faults, twist faults, poor top, cyclic top you need to get the engineering specification right before you start. Right, here we go, right. And a bit of trouble with my mouse again. A further example of ineffective practice. If we don't scarify wide enough, we end up blocking the path of water from the formation under the track to the drain. Uh, again, bad press from this, and I hate to say it, this particular photograph was taken on a new build stretch of railway. The issue here, not so much about scarification, but about preparation of the formation. There's a ruddy great ridge of clay between the formation and the drain, so you're creating a canal under the track bed. The same job had similar, in fact, worse problems under concrete bear of S and C. So the problem here is formation and ballast conditions, not the steel sleepers. Recent tales of scarified mud at track loading sites in Scotland only add fuel to the fire. 
and the steel sleepers have a tarnished reputation in the UK. It's not the steel sleepers, it's the engineering behind the track renewal. So a couple of technical applications now to run through. Well, will start with a new build or rebalance the re-sleeper site. So the current network rail standards allows 50 mil shallower support for steel sleepers. That's below the leading edge or soffit, if you like, of the steel sleepers. And if you've got a steel sleeper carcass, only half the 210 mil depth of a concrete sleeper. So uh, the carcass depth is typically 100. Uh, go the, the spade end bit. And you combine that with a reduced sleeper depth, that equates to almost 160 millimetres in total construction depth saving. I've shown there 155, 0.155 metres. And over a typical track width of, say, four metres, steel sleepers generate new ballast savings of over one tonne per metre run, with a reduced excavation depth, generating additional spoil transport and disposal cost savings. So if you don't need to dig it, you don't need to cart it away. So it's, it's a, a double uh, benefit you get. In re-sleeper only, as we said before, steel sleepers are more tolerant of poor ballast quality than either concrete or timber bearers. And a slightly misjudged assessment of existing ballast conditions can be accommodated. So what do we do? After removing the existing rails and sleepers, we scarify the bed by on-track machinery. That breaks up the, the ballast it removes the ballast memory of where the old sleeper bearing area was and creates new drainage paths, hopefully with a crosswall to a working drain. The excess top ballast can be ploughed to the sides to level the surface. And then you place the steel sleepers either by hand or by on-track machines. And once you've got them in, you secure the rails back on, bring in the displaced top ballast to redistribute it in the tamping areas, and that's you ready for tamping. At overbridge sites, what we've got these days for the development of existing routes, additional clearance at overbridges in Scotland, it's overhead electrification, efficient electrification, or the new buzzword, voltage controlled clearances. These may be needed, mean, mean, these may need the track level to be lowered. Typically, we've got arch structures. The Victorians built them very handy, they were, they suited the profile of the trains of the day. Not so clever when you want to put a square container through there, and not so clever if you want to dangle overhead wires from the middle of the soffit of the bridge somewhere. So a typical track lowering of, say, 300 mil from a twin track railway is roughly 75% less expensive than a bridge redeck. And that seems to be the flavour of the day. Whenever I, I ask what's the cost of it, we get well, it's going to be 5 million for a bridge deck and 1.25 million for the track lower. And the track lower is invariably selected as well. It's the least cost option, bang for buck, Scottish taxpayers paying for this, blah, blah, blah. And rightly so. If we can change the profile of the track and have an effective track geometry, then why wouldn't you? Because sometimes what's above the railway is disruption for the public, the public that don't travel by trains. So for track lowering, steel sleepers can reduce your excavation volumes. And I've shown there the difference between the hatched area, the yellow area. You can reduce your installation durations. It's a quicker build because you don't have so much muck shift muck away. You potentially avoid structure underpinning because you're not going so deep. You've got a structure above you. You've got something that structure's planted on. And the foundations of the structure come into play whichever, whatever you're doing, but you can quite often on the steel sleeper say, well, actually I'm not affecting the subgrade and you can avoid the need for structure underpinning. And that has a minimal impact on existing track drainage systems here. What you see on the left-hand profile, the steel sleeper, is the existing 250 drainage pipe sitting in there, not affected by the lowering, but still got the ballast depth in there. Whereas in the concrete sleeper site, the drain has to be lower, it has to be dug down, it has to be renewed. So your steel sleepers will reduce the impact on any existing drainage systems. At underbridge sites, so as Network Rail are going through their uh, portfolio of underbridge structure refurbishments, strengthening and the like, 
uh, quite often come across uh, ballast and spring decks, longitudinal wave beam supports that need to be replaced with conventional track forms. Typically, you create a new modern structure that saves you a bit of depth thickness, but then you have to put your infrastructure back on the top. And if you choose a concrete sleeper option, you have concrete sleeper, 200, 250 sleeper depth, depending on speed, and that all builds up to the construction height. If you use a steel sleeper, you can have a reduction in your track lift by up to 155, that same 155 millimeters we mentioned earlier. And that spreads out from the structure, and this might be a structure going over a bridge, over a road, if you don't have to lift it up 155, you can then retain your current embankment widths. And as well as that, because you've got a lighter track form, you've got reduced ballast, you've got reduced weight of item, you're saving in dead load. So your reductions in track dead load, just over a ton per meter run. That's, that's impressive on a typical 10 meter bridge, but longer bridges, it's even better. That again, reduction in dead load, will allow you a more economical structure design. You can have a structure that is, uh, doesn't have to bear the same amount of dead load, and therefore it can be made leaner and therefore more cost effective, simply because you've chosen a track form that is lighter and requires less ballast. So in your redecking at underbridge sites, that's a little table, that gives a, an assumed structure length of say 10 meters, <coughs> excuse me, typical underbridge structure, 10 meters long. And right down at the bottom, the static load comparison, 2.444 tons per meter run for steel sleepers and 3.514 tons per meter run for dead load, just to support the track. And that's, you know, any bridge engineer would say, I'll have that, I'll have that steel sleeper, provided We've got the correct track category in the top, and we've got people that are willing to accept steel sleepers as a replacement for a concrete scenario. A couple of illustrations uh, of bridge redecking. Uh, the first one, quite an interesting one, I swing bridge east in Falkirk. I, this bridge structure was at one time, as the name suggests, a swing bridge over the Fort and Clyde Canal. Uh, it later became a fixed bridge. Uh, it was a steel bridge with longitudinal timbers. The longitudinal timbers were in a poor condition. Uh, in fact, long, long term issues there, uh, which led to a derailment. And uh, the solution to the problem was quite cleverly deemed to be take out the longitudinal timbers, do some replating on the steel work and install a timber waterproof deck with ballast on top. Steel sleepers were used uh, to maintain the track geometry, uh, bearing in mind you've got an overbridge very close by, and uh, also to reduce the dead load in the structure. Even more interesting, it was carried out uh, by two competing contractors. The Civils Watts carried out the first engineering, and uh, STRC Jarvis carrying out the track work. A further example, uh, if I can get it to scroll down the next page, yep, here we go. Uh, redecking an underbridge uh, as part of the race farm freight terminal up in Dice. I were reinstating a double track over a very mature structure and again requiring to keep the dead load to a minimum. Uh, another successful job using steel sleepers. With concrete sleepers, we may well have had to completely renew the underbridge. Very expensive for the project. So how do we do it then? How do we get these steel sleepers in effective and working? It's all to do with installation methodology. For all the steel sleeper scenarios we've talked about, from new build, lower bridges, under bridges, track lowering, all of that stuff. The key in all of this is adequate compaction of the ballast bed, and that's critical to the success. Best achieved by the track, by iterations of track lifting, by tamping, and then consolidation by dynamic track stabilizer, your DTS or AFM. So how do we do that? We 
lay, lay the steel sleepers in, put the rails on, and then as we do each tamp, the dynamic track stabiliser consolidates the ballast bed via its perpendicularly loaded vibrating trolley. The DTS imparts that load downwards as the vibration goes side to side at 40, 45 hertz, and that rearranges the ballast particles below the sleepers to fit these tightly together, reducing the voids, and effectively it piles, like a pile would do, piles the steel sleeper into the ballast. The steel sleeper will, will go down until that ballast meets the underside of the steel sleeper inside the trough. And then it'll start to bear the weight. And it's only at that stage can you start to do effective tamping. So you have to have this iterative cycle. The AFM machine picture there is ideal for doing this. It's got a ballast regulator. You see there the, the plows out. Behind that, there's a ballast hopper. Behind that, there's a DTS bank. And behind that, there's a tamping bank. Right, so all of that machinery works as a single machine pass. It ballasts, it tamps, it DTSs in a single pass, and then it goes back to the start again and does it all again. And that iterative process, provided you have enough ballast brought in by the plows, will keep that going and keep that consolidated and have no voids in it. As a core construction methodology, the DTS process and the tamping iterative cycle process generates a cost, saving, cost savings by avoiding TSRs, the need for follow-up tamping there. The picture you see is second pass of a DTS, and you can see where the existing track ends and the new steel sleeper track begins because of the consolidation that's happening below that loaded vibrating trolley. The encoder wheel at the front with a little red uh, can on it is keeping track of all uh, consolidation, and that produces a record for the technician on site to see. And he can figure out for any given lift with the tamper how much consolidation he's getting with the DTS. The DTS work settings need to be adjusted to suit steel sleepers. What you do is reduce the applied downforce, you have a higher vibration frequency, and a higher working speed compared to that used for concrete sleepers. So typically, your DTS is working at 600 meters an hour, and it should be keeping up with the tamper that's just immediately in front of it. Your tamper work setting needs adjustment too. If you've only got a sleeper carcass that's 100 mil deep, you need to adjust your tool depth, and you need to adjust the squeeze pressure, because you have to accommodate that reduced carcass depth, and you have to allow for the ballast being forced partly upwards into the steel sleeper trough. Moving on to installation methodology, uh, and I'll start with the simplest as far as steel sleepers are concerned. Given their weight and configuration, steel sleepers are well suited to both traditional manual installation methods and mechanisation. Installation by hand was commonplace uh, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, indeed, in that time frame, we, we, we were able to uh, have really, really good production rates. I have to say the best we had was on a job between um, Huntley and Kinesmond, where we achieved in a nine hour rules of the route, 24 length relayed with steel using men to handball the sleepers into place. A source shift for the guys, but Given uh, that the country is moving into a recession and unemployment is rising, it's something that we should bear in the back of our mind for the immediate future. Do we need a lot of machinery? Big machines uh, have a carbon footprint. People don't, to the same extent. Let's see if I can get this to move on. Yeah. Uh, Again, a, a variation on the theme, installation by hand with assistance from an excavator. It's an area that uh, perhaps needs a little more development and refinement. A couple of years back, I did mention to Colin Neal and Billy McCulloch, you've got these wonderful um, gantry systems out there. Uh, can you come up with some form of clamp that will lift 
a dozen bundles of steel sleepers, put them down, uh, leave one, lift the rest and carry on, so on and so forth, something uh, that could be developed further. The 1990s and early 2000s uh, on some of our rural routes, uh, and by rural routes I include the Glasgow and South Western Main Line and the Aberdeen to Inverness Line, uh, we undertook a lot of sleeper only renewals where we had uh, good rail, £109, £110, even £98 uh, rail, which was in good condition, yet the sleepers and fastenings were poor. The solution there was to turn the jointed track into CWR by cropping off the bolt holes, welding the joints up, closures in every so often, and installing steel sleepers. Uh, something that uh, seems to have gone out of vogue. Uh, I'm sure it's still a valid method. Uh, again, looking at sustainability, why take away rail that has got a lot of life left in it on these secondary routes uh, and replace it with new? Moving on to mechanised methods, uh, code sleeper layers uh, have been used and have been developed. Uh, the photograph on the right is on the Stirling Alloa Concarden job uh, and shows a Fillmore uh, sleeper layer being towed by an excavator. The photograph on the left is interesting in that it was the prototype uh, Thompson sleeper layer which was trialled on the Nielsen branch uh, on a relay up there. I, it was a prototype that needed a bit more tweaking, but again, another method that we can utilize. Right there. Oops, I've gone too far. Uh, a really useful tool in our armory was the Slinger train. Sadly, the Slinger train is no more. One of the great benefits of the Slinger train was that it could bring both rails and sleepers to site. Uh, it's shown here working on the e and main line near Winchborough on a scarify site. And as you can see here, we had plenty of good ballast to scarify. Just a shame that the train is no longer available, but uh, I'm sure the principle could be used again in the future. Finally, uh, Balfour Beatty's NTC. Uh, this was used uh, extensively on the Erdu to Bathgate reopening, uh, where I think almost all the plane line was laid by uh, the Balfour NTC. The beauty, of course, about steel sleepers in the Balfour NTC is that you can carry a lot more steel than you can concrete sleepers. So, it's uh, giving you much, much better cycle time. Uh, you're not having to reload the train so often. You can bring a lot more steel sleepers to site. Whoops, sorry, Tom. I seem to have. There we go. I've got an oversight. Oh. That's yep. okay. I'm sure, I'm sure it'll calm oh, down oh, in a minute. Yep, there we go. Settle down. Yeah, I know that was me because it's the unusual picture of the underside of a steel sleeper. Not a lot of people get to see the underside of a steel sleeper, but that's a ballast crystal's high view of what it's going to sit under for the next 50 plus years. Those two little grey bits in there are the hook in shoulders of the, uh, the pandrel housings. I'll have to see from this distance if they're, you know, we'll go with fast clips. But steel sleepers have a typical long life, uh, plus 50 years, and as you've seen in South Africa, they're 75 years and still going strong. And the components that sit on top of them are easily replaced, they hook in. So that little bit of cast iron in there is the panel fastening, the rail fastening. It just hooks into a hole, easily replaced. If it becomes broken, you try, you take a, a fast slip on a concrete sleeper and you break the lug off it. Oh, well, you throw the whole sleeper away. How unsustainable is that? Or you reach for your diamond tip drill, you core it out, make a mess with epoxy and don't have a very effective item at the finish. 
Sorry, anybody from Pando who's talking and listening. Okay, the optimized carcass design uh, offers insect resistance, chemical resistance, and it's been extensively tested in site and in labs and with many different sleeper and fasting combinations. Unlike concrete, steel sleepers are fully recyclable at the end of their life and therefore the more attractive as a sustainable resource. And this is us tackling now a bit more about what we should be concerned about in terms of our climate, technology, sustainability, and going forward, reduced carbon footprint. And I will acknowledge that although pre-stressed concrete sleepers can be recycled, they can be crushed to extract the steel reinforcement and the cast iron and make the fill out of the crushed concrete. That process cost exceeds the value of the recovered materials and therefore recycling is rarely performed because there's no money in it. It's as simple as that. If you take concrete sleepers, they are dead loads, 280, 300 odd kilograms, you're gonna crush it, you're gonna extract the steel and the cast iron, sort it out, and then you're gonna use what the crushed concrete is filled somewhere. Nah, there's no market for it. And the life cycle. On the other hand, steel sleepers retain a significant value at the end of the life which can be very easily realized just by applying some heat, it's gonna melt. But bear in mind the current UK average of recycled content for new steels, at the moment 59%, recovery of these lightweight stackable steel sleepers is a much simpler operation. But I met anybody that's ever replaced concrete sleepers with steel, and I've done a few jobs like that, the stack a higgledy-piggledy mass of tons and tons of concrete sleepers left at the end of the job it's just a nightmare to deal with logistically. Every one of them is an accident waiting to happen. The burden of disposal, the liabilities, the costs are there for much less when you compare steel against concrete sleepers. And here, Network Rail and other influencers, they could be talking to manufacturers and saying, let's have 100% recycled steel in our sleepers and thereby contribute even better, even more improvements in carbon and material efficiency. So let's have a wee talk about the embodied carbon assessment. I'm not an expert in this, I'm a track engineer. A clever man I know called Tim Danson put some of this information together for me. The assessment I'm gonna show in the following slides quantifies GHG, greenhouse gas emissions, and it associates to them with embodied carbon. And embodied carbon as the emissions from the product stage and transport to site to in, in situ use. It compares steel sleepers against your pre-stressed concrete varieties in a typical track construction scenario. We could choose any. GHG emissions, your gas emissions, are expressed in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2e, according to the relative global warming potential. Uh, if two or three years thinking of switching off, bear with me. The scope of the assessment here is to look at both sleepers, steel and concrete, for say a kilometre of new network rail Cat 3 track, say 90 mile an hour, 10 EGM PTA, using the construction parameters shown in the good book 2102. The assessment was undertaken in line with network rail's carbon, capital carbon guidance note and uses the RSSB's real carbon tool. The assessment has a few assumptions. We assume that crushed granite, let's say from clover, is used in the material, and all the materials are assumed to be locally sourced, that's within 50 kilometers of the site. And the other assumption is the average UK recycled content for steel is 59%. So what do we get? In our kilometer then, we've got the reduced weight of the steel sleepers compared to the concrete sleepers. Circled there, 129 tons of steel, versus 440 tonnes of pre-stressed concrete. And that's a significant factor when you start to calculate embodied carbon emissions. When you run the numbers and combine it with a minimal difference in the respective emission factors, there's around about 2%. You got a 29% overall reduction in embodied carbon emissions for steel compared to concrete. And the difference there shown nearly 900 tonnes of CO2e but that's sit in that same kilometre if you use rolled steel versus reinforced concrete. And a wee financial comparison, just for those that are not convinced by the sustainability. If you're interested in CapEx, 
and the only figures I could get was Chorus's 2003. They estimated in 2003 terms, the total cost savings by adopting the steel sleeper track form was £37,000 per track kilometre. That calculation was based on a Type 400, which was the sleeper of the day, and they were then £24. And I hear lots of you saying, oh, well, the cost of steel went up, blah, blah, blah. But the cost of steel might be more. The cost of concrete is less per item. We have to think beyond that and think about the carbon uh, footprint of these items. The embodied carbon is important. The ballast and material handling savings were added to that capex figure, and that included disposal or cleaning of recovered material. And at the time, the rail track engineers believed that the savings were much higher than £37,000 a kilometre, and they put the total cost of a track replacement with steel sleepers 275k, sorry, 275,000 per track kilometre, with 430,000 per track kilometre for concrete sleepers. And that's a huge difference. And that rail track estimate is, equates to a remarkable 41% reduction in capex if you choose steel. The evaluation, this little chart on the right hand side of this, shows comparative costs for a track remediation project using steel versus concrete. In that comparison, the only category where steel sleeper costs are higher than concrete is the unit rate per sleeper. If you look at LPM, labour plant management, ballast delivery, rail, rail is the same, ballast cost, spoiled disposal, and rail delivery, which is the same. The only one that steel sleepers score against concrete sleepers is the unit rate per sleeper. If never rail could increase the volume of steel sleepers, the costs could come down. But that, of course, requires acceptance of steel sleepers by all of those responsible for specifying track works. And if we've got the current negative attitudes that I see and the perceptions that steel sleepers are somehow an inferior product, then we need to change this thinking if the real industry in a whole is to be serious about improving sustainability. In conclusion, a little bit about the government's attitude. The UK government's declared target is to remove diesel-only trains by 2040. And the UK rail industry is now focused on this and other ways and means of achieving a thing they call route decarbonisation. Some of the projects that are coming out to the market are all about decarbonisation of this, the Snow Hill branch or some other branch. Or it's, a, it's a big uh, vote winner, decarbonisation. People are getting switched on to decarbonisation. And in Scotland, the electrification of Scottish Railways supports the Scottish Government's key strategic outcome to reduce emissions in pursuit of that greener Scotland ideal by providing cleaner, more efficient traction for rail services. That's great. That's what's happening above the rails. But we need to think root and branch, and the root of this is the track form. So while rail electrification programmes could help deliver economic growth through those faster journey times and improvements for passenger and, and freight capacity, we need to think about everything from the bottom up. We need to think about the track. Because in support of those electrification clearances, that track lowering at overbridges is invariably the selected option based on cost, for the reasons we've outlined earlier. And designers are already making full use of voltage control clearances to minimise the impact of track lowering, especially those arch overbridges. But that still means a track lowering. And if you start to think about, well, let's go with steel at track lowering sites, you're not only going to provide significant installation cost saving, but you're also going to be making a positive contribution towards decarbonisation. And the projects we see now have decarbonisation as a central theme. And that rationale of adopting steel sleepers wherever possible and not saying a blanket, thou shalt not install sleepers on my project, that applies to all four technical applications. So if the project involves an underbridge, an overbridge, a re sleeper, a re ballast, or a brand new track, it's difficult to ignore the cost benefits and embodied carbon savings of steel sleeper track form. Adopting steel sleepers as a ballasted track form of the future aligns well with the Scottish Government's intention for Scotland to be a net zero carbon producer by 2045. And I reckon, Jim and I reckon, it's time for the merits of steel sleepers to be fully recognised. 
and along with that recognition for engineers to select the appropriate methods of insulation and maintenance and the eventual renewal of this track form and we have to embrace that by today's generation of track engineers and not adopt the sense well I heard him say that steel sleepers are the bad guys so I'm not going to specify them for my project or my track renewal we need to stand back as engineers and say what's the benefits what's the disbenefits and have an evaluation thank you and we'll take questions now I have no questions in the chat so far so if someone could find the chat box and just say hello then I'll know that that function is working and if that fails I'm going to open the microphones to all and that'll be bedlam You have chosen Bedlam. I will open the microphones to all. You are all now unmuted. So click unmute yourself and feel free to give us a question if you have any. Jim, it's Peter Dearman speaking. Hello, Peter. Hi. Um, I, was, I was really interested in the, uh, the the installation technique for steel sleepers. I've not actually seen that spelled out so clearly as you've done tonight. Thank you for that. To what extent do you believe that the poor reputation that steel sleepers have gained is the result of maintenance uh, following the same routines that were applied to their concrete predecessors and thus being inappropriate for making sure that the ballast is properly tamped and compacted at maintenance cycles is that an influence not so sure it's, a, it's an influence peter but when when you think about what's the maintenance responding to so the maintenance is responding to let's say a track geometry fault Mm. that track geometry fault is perhaps inherent in the insulation technique so it's come from somewhere it's not developed on its own no. why would one location be different from another so you have to look and say well what happened during the insulation at that particular location that gives rise to this intervention the idea about steel sleeper insulation it's not that quick fix you have to think about what you're doing if you've mm. got areas uh, that your si says <laughs> needs a different track bed treatment before you put your steel sleepers in then fine steel sleepers as a re sleeper only re-sleeper only uh, were once upon a time the quick win they cannot be seen as a quick win anymore unless you've got accurate si that says yes the ballast conditions the existing ballast conditions i want to reuse again are sufficient to support any kind of sleeper steel or otherwise and it's once you get to that stage you can start to get the benefits or steel sleeper installation. What we've had in the past that's contributed to this tarnished reputation of a steel is people saying, well, I can just do a quick scarify and dope in these steel sleepers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And get away with that. And that, that then leaves the problem with the poor maintainer. And I've been a poor maintainer, you know, where you wake up on a Monday morning and you're left with a fairly ordinary renewal site that the weekend guys have left. And you're left to go on with it. You have to mother and father it from there to its dying day and you're looking at the next 50 years the maintainer with all due respect doesn't have the tools at his disposal and maybe some of them haven't been developed yet to and to attend to individual or small groups of steel sleepers with a wet bed yeah. but in any in any railway scenario a wet bed in a steel in a concrete sleeper scenario you'll go and fix it and you might just end up chasing it downhill it's, you know, there were, there were techniques and tricks to be done with steel sleepers, the same as there are with concrete <clears> sleepers. But all of that involves the correct attitude and the correct tools and the correct process. Yeah, thanks for that. Tom, uh, Jim, it's Harry Archibald. Can you hear me? Everybody hear me okay? Yep, yeah. I hear you fine, Harry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a question of where to start, really, because uh, myself and steel sleepers have got a bit of history, as they say, and Jim will remember some of this back from the 
Thorn in TRC days, but uh, interesting that, that Peter asked the first question there from uh, as as essentially an electrification engineer because what, what has all, always concerned me is that the, the debate about steel sleepers is much more than just uh, track engineering questions that, that, that arise and historically I've always been uh, some would say overreacted to the, the, the interface with track circuits uh, but there's also the point of, uh, of interface with electrification systems, both AC and DC. Coming back to the, 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 the basis of you know, what, is, what I'd like to offer just now is uh, that for steel sleepers, the, the possibility of a track circuit failure and be traced back to the, the loss of insulation on once it, on the side of, on one side, say the the, the cess side rail of uh, a track circuit length, and same time with uh, loss of insulation on any other sleeper within that track circuit on the four foot the four foot side. Uh, whereas with concrete sleeper track, you've got to lose insulation properties on both sides of the same concrete sleeper. Never, rail track never really recognised that at, at some point in time, due, due to the functions not talking to each other, which is hardly a new thing. That there was a, a net, there still is, to my belief, a network rail company standard which says that basically track circuits and uh, steel sleepers do not mix and should not be used, uh, should not be applied uh, at, 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 on you know at the same time. Just that the uh, most of the examples that uh, your excellent presentation brought up of it, uh, where steel sleepers had successfully been employed on the continent and uh, uh, South Africa, Southern Hemisphere, etc., either in, in involved non track circuitry lines or, in the case of Germany and France and Austria, uh, where axle counters are the preferred method of, of train detection. And this takes me back to the long debate I had with, with you for during uh, the intermediate stages of the uh, early bathgate when I was trying to uh, make a, a rear guard action case for, for the, the, the application of axle counters instead of the uh, track circuits. But yeah. on, from, from an OLE point of view, uh, sorry, from an electrification point of view, there are, uh, and I've been interested to hear Peter or MDLC's thoughts on this about whether uh, if you could conceive of a design of steel sleeper which did not require, from a signal engineering point of view, electrical insulation between the rail and the ballast, whether you could produce a cheaper concrete sleeper and how that would fit in with the requirements for AC 25 kV or 50 kV electrification and on the other hand uh, DC electrification uh, even in, in, including such as Edinburgh tram but my fairly recent experience is that you, you want to insulate the, return, the, the, the rails from earth throughout would imply that you still have to uh, employ uh, rail to sleep in a bleak ballast insulation. If I can uh, park your, your, your straight current uh, part of the question, Harry, and just deal with the, the scenario you posted of your... Fair enough, by the way, I'll, I'll shut off for a moment. <laughs> okay, let's say your track form has lost the insulation property, so you've got a, a path from one rail to the other and therefore track circuit failure. That's that's a maintainer's uh, issue. If you are, that means that you've got an insulator, a rail insulator or a pad problem where you've got rail steel to sleeper steel contact. You don't have rail steel to, to sleeper steel contract under normal circumstances. And if you're looking after your railway properly, you will never have that. So regular maintenance should be able to identify where you've got 
uh, pad or insulator wear to the extent that you've worn it away to nothing and you've then allowed the pan roll clip or the real foot to come in contact with the sleeper. And before you start to get alarmed and say, that's my track circuit failure, the track engineer should be alarmed to say, I'm the how I've lost my resilience, I've lost my holding down force on the rail to, to sleeper. So before it's a, an issue for the signal engineer, it should be an issue for the track engineer. And that's all to do with a, adequate maintenance. Maintenance should involve regular inspection of items. And unless you've got an unusual situation, the materials, if they're all installed at the same period, the materials for that section of line should be all be degrading at the same rate or roughly the same rate. You should be able to predict if you're doing maintenance properly when you need to repad or re-insulate. And in fact, that should be a regular maintenance activity. And if some people on the call here think it isn't, then they're misguided. You have to look after the track. You don't fire the track into the ground, give it a tamp and walk away. You have to inspect it regularly. You have to know it's beginning to fail and you have to do intervention before it does fail. If you've got the situation where you've got a track circuit fail you because you've lost insulation between the rail and the sleeper, then you failed as a track engineer. Yeah, I but to, to, just same... to, 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 to come back slightly, slightly on that, the, the point I was making was that if you lose that insulation on one side of a steel sleeper and a quarter of a mile away from the same track circuit section, there's a loss of insulation on the other leg, then conceivably you can get a track circuit failure. I doubt if any maintenance routine from a, a track engineering point of view is ever going to pick up that likelihood. It, it will right, let, let me say, Harry, uh, Harry if, if we go back to the beginning, I understand where a lot of your concerns are coming from, particularly in the early days of steel sleeper renewals when we were using the W402 sleeper with the pan draw clips, etc., because uh -huh. everything came site to site loose and you had an issue, a quality issue, where pads could be missed out. And pads were missed out. Insulators were missed out or improperly uh, installed. As you and I are still bearing the scars, Jim. Oh, yes, we, we, we are indeed from some of the early ones. But I think to say the product has moved on since then. We've gone to the H series which comes to sight, uh, the, 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 the pass clips, um, the hook-in shoulders, the pads and the insulators, they are all factory installed. Yeah. So we, yeah. we've reduced one of the issues, we've taken away one of the issues. Uh, and now we're looking at service life. And I, you know, Tom's hit the nail on the head there. When we need to change pads, we need to change them all. I say if, if we have rail to sleeper contact uh, through time, we're, we're in big trouble. We've lost our resilience. We've probably lost our toll load as well. Uh, I think a, a, another part of the solution to the track circuit problem is moving towards axle counters. Yeah. Uh, generally, and, and certainly in sites where there are water and dampness issues. I, I always recall when we did a renewal on the run in to Winchborough Tunnel, went out there in the Monday morning to have a look at it under traffic, and the trains were all stopped because the water was lapping up to the railhead. So the track circuits had dropped. That would have happened with concrete as well, probably. Definitely with steel, probably with concrete. So it's an interdisciplinary issue that, ne that needs to be resolved. I think we need to move away from track circuits. We need to follow the Germans, the Austrians, the Swiss, uh, and go down the road of uh, axle counters. Thanks, Jim. Uh, any more questions from anybody? Please unmute your speaker and I'll un unmute your mic, sorry, and I'll see you. Jack Scott, come on, Jack. Tell us what you want. Oh, come on, I'm just trying to see if this mic works because it's a new one. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Jack. Do you have a question for hey, the presenter? 
Yes, I've got a question for you because I know you're getting quite involved with high school pride electrification these days. Do you think there's a case there? Most of the time. Yes, I know. But do you think there's a case there for maybe steel sleepers being used to keep the cost down? It's very, very difficult, as I said in the, in the presentation, to ignore the benefits and sustainability. We, we, we talk quite a lot about decarbonisation. We talk about sustainability. And yet here we have a product which offers all of the benefits of decarbonisation and sustainability. And indeed, CapEx. If you want to build, if you want to double the line uh, between Busby and East Kilbride, why wouldn't you prepare and lay a nice fresh ballast bed uh, lay off some steel sleeper packs, put them in, position them, and then put some rails on the top of it from your other line. Use your existing line as a as a haul route, and then and then get your tamping machines on DTS. You know, if you get that, then that line being tamped in DTS is then open, is ready to open at service speed. It's ready to open without TSRs. The benefit of using the DTS. Is, is twofold in steel sleepers. It provides the consolidation and stability that they need to support the CWR, but it also provides the ability to open the line at line speed, no TSR. And at commissioning, when you're thinking about any size of a new route, having no TSRs is vital. When the Settle Carlisle line did that 36,000 metres of relay in that month, Imagine the chaos that would have ensued if the track had been opened after that month with 36,000 metres of 20 mile an hour TSR. The timetable wouldn't have been sustainable. But yet, it was opened at 70 mile an hour full line speed, timetable running, and ready to accept the heavy coal that was getting trucked down from Scotland at that time to the English power stations. And that, that was vital for that line's survival. And that's what the Tamper DTS package gives you. The correct installation of steel sleepers is key to the whole thing. If you plan it well, if you do your proper SI, if you understand what you're going into, if you prepare the track bed, if you tamp it and consolidate it, you can walk away and not put a follow-up tamper there for the next three weekends. That's where your savings are. That's where the big savings are. You're taking men and machinery away from the railway to somebody else because you've attended to it during the core works period. In terms of the East Kilbride branch, I think steel sleepers should be installed. I am challenging the client requirements technical. I will challenge the client requirements technical because I can, but I can't change perceptions. I can't make the track ram say any different from what he said at the moment. And what he said at the moment on the East Kilbride branch is, thou shall not install steel sleepers, even though he's got miles of them up there. Probably a selling point too is the amount of uh, reconstruction of bridges as well, because maybe uh, don't the, need to reconstruct as many. Exactly the the uh, the dead load. In my view, steel sleeper score in so many areas. Yes, there is additional risk, as Harry highlighted, on the potential for track circuit failures if that happens to be your train detection system. Okay, but. As long as you know that that's a risk, you can manage that risk and you can mitigate. And if it means additional vigilance being paid to pad condition, insulator condition, whatever, it might be something more in the design where you say, I won't have high cant deficiency curves because that leads me to a side post failure. Uh, and then I have the potential for track circuit failure. Right? That might mean that be something that you take out because I've installed this better, more effective track form. Oh, Tom, just to add to your point about in relation to East Kilbride, uh, if the approach could be made on a cross functional infrastructure basis, including the method the, the method to be adopted of uh, to be applied of for, for drain detection, plus any electrification clearance issues be facilitated by uh, the the lower ballast depth etc then perhaps the case could be improved. Well, that's a case we make, Harry, is that, is that you know, as we, we I tried to illustrate in the, the track lowering example, if you put a steel sleeper in, you release 150, 160 millimetres that you don't have to dig out. Yeah. 
but for the same track support mechanism these are these are not high speed high tonnage lanes these are low speed uh, high frequency lanes yeah. 50 mile an hour stuff ideally suited in my view for a steel sleeper I mean you're doing any sort of track lowering and we don't have very many sites efficient electrification or voltage control clearances as they call them now are, are making full use of that but where we have to do a track lowering and it's the last thing as a track engineer I want to do I have to make sure that my track longitudinal track profile is correct and I can have a better uh, chance at achieving a better longitudinal profile if my construction debt my rail to subgrade value is reduced and I get a reduced thing if I use a steel sleeper I get a sustainability benefit I get a capex installation benefit it's it scores all round and yet because I've got a client requirements technical and I can't I can't move it Bill, you you unmuted your microphone. Bill, Bill Reeve. Hi, uh, hello there, colleagues. Um, I, I hope you don't mind if a, a rude mechanical asks what may be a naive question. Um, but I I've had uh, discussions with track engineers in North America involved in in heavy haul uh, uh, railways, uh, where they tend to have an aversion to metal sleepers for heavy tonnages. And in particular, I think it boils down to the concern about voiding underneath the sleepers and how difficult it is to fix that. Now, it may be that that what you said about use of DTS is part of the solution there. But um, I, I'm in, and, and I. But we also have the scars in Scotland from things like uh, uh, the Stirling Alloa project, and um, mm. there was the, uh, the lesson of the Settle and Carlisle steel sleeper relaying. And I, and I think your point about inadequate track formation explains that but i wonder if you could say a little bit more about um the limitations and risks of steel sleepers for heavy tonnage applications in the heavy tonnage application the the americans have a, a different plate thickness depending on what you want to support so if you want to go up to tonnages of 32 ton axle loads mm -hmm. you have you don't have a 10 mil thick steel plate you have a 12 or a 15 so it's a, it's a heavier beast that's put in with a bigger bead to resist the, the bending forces. But the key in all of this, Bill, is the consolidation at installation. Consolidation at installation, if it's done properly, and the Americans are not big fans of the DTS, they do have them, but not many of them. Here, we are blessed with the fact that we have, we in 1988, we brought, I think, 18 DTS machines in from Plaza, uh, and they are still available in the country, the DTS 62 series. And we now have the automatic finishing machines that uh, Schwedelsky Babcock have. And uh, these machines are the all-in-one, one-size-fits-all, regulator, tamper, DTS combined. These are ideal for things. The Stirling Alloa uh, problems that you mentioned were not due to the steel sleeper. They were mm -hmm. due to the inadequate control of ballast, the overall ballast depth. In Stirling Alloa, some of the ballast depth, because of poor control between the earthworks contractor and the trackworks contractor were 900 and a millimeter and a meter deep. Now, when you have that kind of ballast depth and they don't consolidate it in layers, you have the pie crust. You have a DTS running across the top, consolidating the top 300, 400 millimeters, but down below, very soft, very uncompacted. And as you start to run heavy axle trains along it, yes, guess what? Those voids start to reveal themselves, the battle. The, the ballast settles, the track settles with it, and all of a sudden you've got a cyclic top situation. So it's important when we talk about failures of sites, and we, we mentioned steel sleepers in that tagline, that we understand that it's not the sleeper per se that is the issue, it's the construction technique or some other issue. Sometimes it's ballast condition, sometimes it's consolidation, but it's never, I would put it to you, never to do with the sleeper mm -hmm. type. That's that's really helpful. Thank you, Jim. And for what it's worth, I think the oldest steel sleepers I've seen was when I was involved in a project on the Hejaz Railway in Jordan, and they were the original 1908 sleepers still in use. Wow. So, um, so they can last quite well in the right circumstance. Yeah. And the Americans, were, they were in the late 90s on the set of Carlyle, there were two types of sleeper used. One was an American called a tie-in track systems, a TTS. 
And the TTS, in my view, and apologies to anybody from chorus listening, the TTS was a superior sleeper. Why? Because it didn't have any production issues. It came with the spade ends the same length, and it was made from a Corten steel. So corrosion, to, yes, to a certain level, but then it stops. So if you make if you make the steel from the right component or the right the right uh, chemical mix in the steel, you can have that corrosion free item, where it you know it gets to a certain level and then just stops. And the shape of the American TTS was better at the speed end. It held the ballast more captive, and it was actually easier to tamp. And I had that straight from the tamper guys who were doing all of those yardages. Thank you. I would uh, certainly uh, agree uh, with uh, you. There's a lot of interesting detail in this, Jim. Really interesting presentation. I, I should have said thank you right at the start. I found this this uh, a really helpful presentation. Well, we're dependent on on you know people like yourself, Bill, to get the message across. If we are serious about uh, sustainability and decarbonisation, we have to tackle this problem from the subgrade up. What we put from the subgrade up is important. All of that new ballast we're putting on site, all of the old stuff we're carting away, if we can reduce those quantities and the logistics involved in taking those quantities to site, that, that embodied carbon that we talk about, if we can reduce the embodied carbon, then that's us being sustainable and not paying lip service to it. And I get quite passionate about this, you might hear that, but, but we really need to think about the first thing we should be is why can't we install a steel sleeper in this situation and not the other way about? Well, I'm also, uh, frankly, g given the scale of the affordability challenge that, that the railway is facing at the moment and transport markets are changed, we have to be open to uh, to efficiencies in, in all parts of the railway business. So, again, uh, compelling reason to think about this carefully. Thank you. Tom, sorry again, sorry for keeping on. Uh, just a, a, a final, I promise you a final thought from me. Do you think that the combination of concrete sleepers, axle counters on borders was the correct combination? I'm a big fan of axle counters, Harry. Um, concrete sleepers, I, I think it's in this day and age, Knowing what I know now about the sustainability aspects of concrete sleepers, I would question their use anywhere. There's a direct want... conflict between uh, the borders and Airdy Bathgate, which uh, employs track circuits in steel. Well, ex exactly, and it's, it's different thinking. Uh, some projects will specify one thing and another, and sometimes there's no rationale behind it. There's no, you ask people, what's the engineering reason why you wouldn't have this product or why you protected that one? And they've just got, well, just because. And there's no engineering justification. Concrete sleepers have a place, and their place is in the high speed rail environment where rally waves are more of an issue. Steel sleepers above, I would guess, 105, 110 mile an hour wouldn't really see it. I couldn't really see a steel sleeper in a 125 mile an hour railway, although we have them, and they have them successfully. We just need to think a bit more. But where we've got miles and miles of railway that we want to electrify that are not on the highest of speed lines, you know, we're thinking Fife Circle, the Downey Commander can be yawned. You know, all of these projects in Scotland that we're trying to electrify, all of these projects have arched bridges, all of these projects will have track lowering sites and potentially doubling of single line sections of the track. Barhead to command it, let's double that line, why not? Why not do it in steel? Where's the savings to be made? Can somebody do the quantification exercise and tell us what me, the Scottish taxpayer, is going to pay less? I'd be delighted. But we just need to understand as we go forward that sustainability and decarbonisation are not just two words that we play around with. If you want to be serious about it, you have to think. What do I, as an engineer, need to do to install that item and maintain it for the next 50 years? And then when it's done, what do I get out of it? At the moment, every concrete sleeper that comes out of the track gets stuck somewhere. I don't know where they get stuck. Sometimes down the bank, sometimes they're left lying. 
Sometimes they're the nearest access. Sometimes they're at Miller Hill. They never get disposed of properly, in my view, and there's certainly very few of them have ever been crushed and recycled. Steel, you take it out, you stick it back in the pot again, melt it down, and he presto, you got another one. We have to think about this. We have to think about 2050, 2060. Even though we're not going to be here, some of us. I'm not, sure if answer, I'm not sure if I answered your question, Harry, but, but you gave me an opportunity to bump my gums again. So. No, I said, thanks for that, Tom. I mean, there's the, 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 never really again steel sleepers. It's just that the, the question is steel versus concrete. In my mind, has never really been, in, been approached from an overall infrastructure viewpoint. And, and latterly, in particular, but with an added emphasis on sustainability and uh, as you've quite rightly pointed out. And that's what I think. If somebody could invent a concrete sleeper that was as thin as a steel sleeper and, and had the same amount of embodied carbon in it, I think the, the industry would bite your hand off because people would say, well, it's a concrete sleeper and it's done. You know? But we don't have that item. And we've got product approval uh, certificates for steel sleepers We've got installation parameters for steel sleepers. Why can't we use them? And it can't be down to individual preferences. There has to be engineering judgment behind it. And somebody has to tell me why I can't install steel sleepers and justify that in engineering terms. Then I'll believe them. And until that day happens, I'll still be an advocate of steel sleepers on carbon footprint, sustainability, embodied carbon, whatever you want to call it. They are a better item. Any more questions from, from anybody before I, I, I wrap things up? Tom, it's Ross Nelson. Can I ask a question if you don't mind? Yeah, go ahead, Ross. <laughs> um, excellent presentation. Very, very interesting to me as a daft overhead line engineer, of course. Um, no such thing. <laughs> no such thing. <laughs> um, for me, I, I mean, the, the, the words I hear around concrete sleepers tends to be around about that ongoing maintenance requirement. I don't know whether yourself and Jim could maybe touch on how maintenance differs between concrete and, ste and steel sleeper equivalents, and if there's any other you know, different methodologies of plant needed. If you go to tackle uh, a loss of top, say, with a concrete sleeper, you typically send some men out with some duff jacks, they jack up the track, they stuff some ballast underneath the concrete sleeper, they leave it a little bit proud, and then they let it down with a bang, and that gives it the consolidation. You try and do that with a steel sleeper, you're going to fail. You have to approach it with the right tools. You have to have the right can go packing equipment. You have to understand that you're not pushing the ballast together below a flat soffit. You're pushing the ballast upwards to the soffit. The soffit of that steel sleeper is just below the plate. It's not a solid item. It's a trough. And if you imagine an upturned sheep trough, if you can picture that, and you yeah. want to get ballast up inside that upturned sheep trough, pushing the ballast again so Two guys with kango hammers pushing against each other works for a concrete sleeper. It won't work for a steel sleeper. The name of the steel, the name of the game of the steel sleeper is to get the ballast consolidated and up inside. And yes, you might have to give it a bigger lift, but by the same token, it will still go down with the same bang and still be consolidated. But if you haven't filled the void with your kango hammers, then you haven't done the job. It's a different technique, and there are even machines now that have a blank carcass fitted to the end of a vibrator arm. So picture a, a, a back actor with a pecker on it. And instead of the pecker, it's got a steel sleeper blank. So once you splayed the rails, you put that blank over your steel sleeper and you start to vibrate it and you pile it in. So if you've lifted it higher, and let's say you've left that steel sleeper 50 mil proud, you put the plate over the top, set the vibrator in motion, and you pile it down to the right height. You then bring the rails back. That is a method of compaction that you don't have. But you couldn't do that with a concrete, not a single yeah. sleeper. And yet you're using the right tools, the right machinery, you can achieve that compaction. The other thing they go at, uh, you, concrete sleepers, if you have got a broken housing in a concrete sleeper, that's 284 kilograms of scrap you have to throw away. The only technique to do it is that diamond tip drill and the replacement stem. The devil's own work to get that right. So typically, they draw it out, throw it away. 
put a new one in. They're still sleeping, you've got a broken housing. You unclip the rail, unhook the housing, clip a new, unhook a new one in, clip it back up. We're off to have our dinner or home to our loved ones. You know, it's a simple job. Is it? Does it look? In, you know, that's obviously the kind of the maybe a, a, a spot replacement of a of a sleeper. I know Ari obviously mentioned around the the integrity of the insulation, etc. Do any of these activities um, require any additional mechanised plant over and above what you would? use for concrete. So I'm trying to work out if it's simply using the same tooling and equipment that you would use for concrete, just in a different way perhaps, or if it's something dedicated to the, the maintenance of the steel sleepers versus the concrete equivalents. If, if I can jump in here, Ross, is, is using the same, generally using the same kit, but using it in a different way. Uh, for example, if you're wanting to pack the odd uh, steel sleeper, you can quite happily use the Rebel vibratory compactor. The only thing you have to do is you have to surcharge the ballast. So the ballast is flowing up and flowing under the sleeper. So it's, it's using the same tools, but adopting a different methodology. Got you. Thanks for that, Jim. And I guess the last part for me then is, what does the maintenance frequency look like then? I'm just trying to think in my mind around about the kind of the whole life cost piece. Um, you know, the serviceability, you know, service life, uh, maintenance interventions, uh, and thinking about that bigger picture, um, you know, given the, the fact that we, we don't like closing our railway very much. Um, I mean, what, what, is, what does it look like, uh, you know, equivalent um, between the two types of sleepers? The maintenance interventions are actually reduced for concrete sleepers. So, sorry, for steel sleepers. And that's because you don't get the same incidence of wet beds because the sleeper performs differently. Right. It's got a it's got a lighter weight, it spreads it's spreading the ballast from a higher peak. If you measure from the soffit of a steel sleeper, you've a hundred millimeter of ballast depth before you get to the edge of the, the sleeper. And then you've what 150 of ballast under under that straight away. Same line next door concrete sleeper, you've got a lump of concrete and you've got two hundred below that. You've actually got more ballast uh, on a bigger area, spread area, with a steel sleeper than you hire as a concrete sleeper. It's it's far kinder to the ballast, and that's been proven uh, in, in use, that you've less maintenance interventions in terms of uh, failure of the subgrade. They also, because they hold the ballast captive, they are more tolerant of dirty ballast conditions. And that's in, in the scarification example, that's been their downfall. People have thought, well, we can throw a steel sleeper at anything really, and it will bear up. Yes, initially, but once uh, traffic starts to run, then it very quickly loses its top. But in terms of maintenance intervention inspection, no more inspection, no greater inspection frequency than for uh, concrete. Because of the spades on them, they actually hold their alignment better. Uh, because of the way they hold the ballast, they hold their top better. And if you look on the East Kilbride branch, there are miles and miles of steel sleepers up there, and it looks absolutely pristine. And I'm quite sure the East Kilbride branch is not maintained with a tamper and a DTS every other week, and yet the alignment's good. It's a slow speed line, yes, there's no freight on it, yes, but actually the top on it is better than the, the next door, the neighboring concrete equivalent. I don't know that from track recording, I know that from looking at it. So I would, I would say the maintenance interventions are the same, if not better, with a steel sleeper versus a concrete sleeper. Tom, Hi. thanks very much. And Jim, excellent. Thank you for that. And thanks for asking the questions. Really good presentation. Uh, hey. Hi, this is uh, Daniel Pike, just uh, your lurker, I guess, from Corus Steel and British Steel, or X from them. Um, I just wanted to sort of go go back to that point of, of maintenance interventions. I think the history says that the maintenance interventions are greater, but simply because of the, the failures to install them in sensible locations uh, under sensible conditions. So we've although we've been we've been putting we've been throwing them where the track is worst, and and we're surprised when 
they, we have to maintain them a lot. Um, again, I think it's down to making sure they're installed, you know, in a sensible way, in a sensible location, using the right techniques. Because um, if if you if you if you put it into terrible conditions, it's not going to be a surprise that it doesn't perform as well as you would like it to. And that's what I've tried to say in the presentation, Daniel. That it's you know they are not a cure-all for poor ballast conditions. You can't throw steel sleepers at at mud and expect them to perform, you know, as well as well. If you threw a concrete sleeper at that same situation, it would deteriorate in the same order. They are not a cure-all. But if you take a steel sleeper and you install it the way it should be installed, uh, and you attend to it on the core renewal shift, then you can walk away. You can save yourself the follow-up time. You can more or less fit and forget it and look after the fast things. And when they're ready for renewal, renew them. And that's all you need to do. They will just sit there. If you've prepared the thing well, you will, you know, you'll be surprised. No, I, that, I, I'm I trying to get that agree. back on the agenda, and I'm sure you're the same. The, the, the reputation that steel sleepers have is ill-deserved, and it's come about by people blaming the product and not the engineering behind where the product was installed. I think also part of it is that initial ballast consolidation of. of filling them full of ballast because as you say they sit in the ballast not on the ballast um, and so they have to be full to work um, and I think part of the problem is people not necessarily understanding that those little extra holes that you can see in the top of them are actually so you can make sure they're full when you walk away from the track after you've installed it and I, I don't think every engineer has really understood that at some point. They think there are additional holes for, for different gauge fastenings but they are inspection ports and that's what they should be treated as. And when you actually watch a DTS go over a steel sleeper and you watch, you're looking through that inspection hole, it's as if what's actually happening is this sleeper's been driven down, but it looks like the ballast is somehow flowing up as the, as the DTS passes over and it's a joy to watch. And you realize then that it's not until that ballast meets the underside of that plate that that sleeper is starting to bear something, bear pressure. Up until that stage, it's just sitting on that leading edge, just like a knife, and it's cutting its way through the ballast. And teaching engineers that the importance of laying a steel sleeper is to get that trough full, and not just full of ballast, full of consolidated ballast, the DTS is the ideal tool for it. If you can cycle a tamper DTS package over a steel sleeper on new ballast four times, you'll never be back to it for the next 15 years. No, I agree. That's that's exactly how it should be done. And and yes, more power to the elbow on that one. I, I, I wish you the best of luck in sort of challenging the um, the preconceptions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Final question from somebody before I wrap this up. And if not, that's me back to the agenda. Uh, the vote of thanks, I would like to thank Jim for his contribution <laughs> to this uh, presentation and I would like you to thank Jim in the usual manner. <laughs> and, and in turn, I would like to thank Tom uh, for his part in the presentation. Uh, I know Tom is a, a topic very close to your heart and you're very passionate about it. And uh, I just hope that uh, people will take on board what's been said tonight and we will see more appropriate steel sleeper sites in Scotland uh, to the benefit of decarbonisation and the railway as a whole. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jim. And that takes us on to part seven, networking reception, courtesy of yourselves. I'll close the presentation now. It'll, it's been recorded. It'll be made available. And uh, please feel free to have a, whichever drink you of your choice. Thank you all. <laughs>